Good evening to everyone and uh, we are uh, here today to have a discussion about the Jantar Mantar Observatory instruments in particular and uh, we uh, would be having perhaps a series of sessions to go through the nitty gritties of uh, each and every instrument in some sense. Uh, of the all the four extant Jantar Mantar observatories, we have with us today Professor Barry Perlus from Cornell University, whose uh, book The Celestial Mirror celebrates uh, the 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 aesthetic, uh, you know, like the impressions of this in such a such a celebratory manner. And we have with us uh, Anisha Shekhar Mukherjee, conservation consultant, who, whose book about the Delhi Observatory delves into its intricate history of its um, beginnings to various changes which happened along the way and what it is now. And uh, it, so in this discussion today, we welcome you both Barry and Anisha. We are very happy that you are joining us in these uh, discussions. And uh, I also wanted to mention that there is one resource in particular, I think which all of us, all three of us and many of us who are uh, working on this have used. So we would first like to start by mentioning that this is perhaps one of the uh, kind of the center, uh, what is the sources from which, and this resource, the book Savoy Dressing and his Astronomy by Professor Vian Sharma, in fact, and encapsulate all the details of these instruments. What we are trying to um, uh, put forward in a visual manner is really encaps encapsulated in this uh, work quite uh, methodically. So this is one very, very important resource, which is, and one other resource, of course, is um, the jantarmanta.org website, Professor Barry Perlow's site, where all um, the uh, resources visually uh, kind of you know enca encapsulating resources about the observatory which are put together today's session uh, would be essentially looking at uh, one set of instruments uh, and before i mention that I, which these instruments are i think we all all three of us and all of us who are uh, going to be uh, discussing these instruments would also like to acknowledge the um, uh, no, uh, archaeological survey of india the delhi and sarnath circles department of art and archaeology government of rajasthan department of education in madhya pradesh which is uh, overseeing the ujjain observatory for helping us allowing us to do a number of calibration observations over this period so having said that, we would like to um, move forward with discussing about the Jantar Mantar Observatory instruments. And uh, I will uh, ask uh, uh, Mary and uh, Anisha also to give us an input so, overview of the observatory. We have here observatories which are having masonry instruments for basic positional astronomy measurements from positions time from positions of objects in the sky measurement of time as well. So this is what we have in the background. And if we, uh, I, I would like to ask um, Barry, if you would uh, uh, like to share some of your impressions of this observatory before we move on to the instruments. I'm sorry. You have to catch me up. What was behind you? Yeah, I, I was uh, saying that we are going to talk about one specific group of instruments today, the yep. Samrat Yantra instrument. And before we talk about that, I just wanted that we all share with the viewers a little bit of overview of what the observatory is about and what it means to us. Uh, 
Okay, well, to do that briefly, um, just that I was so impressed by the um, by the form and the the power of the architectural um, sense of the instruments. At the same time, uh, when I first encountered them, I didn't know much about astronomy um, other than basic science, you know, education. And it compelled me to learn what these instruments were about, what the whole site was for, um, its significance historically and in, in the culture of South Asia. And, um, and also an opportunity to be able to show what had been so moving to me, so influential on me to the, the rest of the world by um, using the skills and the expertise I have in photography. Um, and my life has really been about um, the observatories in a way, at least a part of my life has been about them for the past 30 years. They never cease to be new in, in the sense that anyone who has been there knows that they present a connection to the cosmos in a very palpable way, in a way that no other sites except maybe the really ancient um, stone circles, the ancient um, observational sites in other parts of the world do. But, but these are so powerfully current. And I think architects agree that there is something about the form converting the geometry of um, astronomical relationship, astronomical measurements, taking all of those geometries, both planar and spherical, and representing them in physical form um, will never be old. Enough said. <laughs> uh, Anita, you, you wanted to uh, uh, help us give an overview to the viewers about the observatory. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak about the Jadhar Mantras, which I think are, as Barry mentioned, what is one aspect of them, which I think is really remarkable, is that they deal with aspects of time, but they do so in a way which is, uh, even though they date from about 300 and you know, 50 odd years ago, they seem very modern, you know, they, in a sense, they're timeless because um, what, what I realized is when I first, um, came to the observatories, which was part of the, you know, the initial work for the conservation of the Delhi Observatory. And though I had learned about them in history of architecture and, you know, as, as a student and as an architectural profession in India, when I actually started doing the research and trying to understand the instruments, it was, it was a revelation and it was a huge learning experience because I think there are two main aspects of the observatory complexes that I'd like to stress. One is the fact that every aspect of their um, existence is interlinked. So their, their form, their detailing is, is very much a part of their function. The materials that were used, the shapes that we see and we are very intrigued by and we think they're fantastic. Actually, they have a very precise function. And that's incredible, the, you know, because they're very much unlike anything that was constructed in their time and after as well. And I think that is something that perhaps is not sufficiently appreciated. So everybody knows about the Jantar Mantars and everybody sort of you know, recognizes their forms, but everybody perhaps doesn't appreciate what their forms actually are uh, 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 sort of prelude to or what why they were made the way they were. The second thing which I think is extremely um, important about the observatory complex is the manner in which all the Jantar Mantras were constructed. So there was a huge amount of research that preceded the development of each of the instruments. And many of these instruments are actually made for the first time, uh, you know, anywhere in the world. So many of them are, though they're based, some of them on earlier instruments in India or rest, the rest of the world, they are finally, they're quite unique because they're experiments. 
and uh, the manner, the research and the methodology in which uh, Jay Singh, Savai Jay Singh, who was the person who established the observatory complexes and his entire team worked, it was, I think it can be a lesson in good research, you know, at any any point in, in time, because they surveyed um, extensively all that existed in their time and before. They actually made smaller instruments to uh, check out the principles of these uh, masonry, these huge masonry instruments that we see today. And then to convert uh, into a building, you know, as, as architects, I think all of us know the process of construction and the process of conception. Uh, very often, there's a huge gap between them. So to successfully do that at such a huge scale for you know the first time is is an incredible feat. So I think those are two aspects that I think uh, I would really like to bring forward and share with everybody that we need to appreciate about the observatories and of course you know dr ratnashri will will tell us more about their function i think and how it relates to our present day times as well uh, but the only thing i'd also like to say is that it's extremely important and this is the point i think that all of us are trying to bring forth again is that to appreciate them therefore they ought to be brought back into functioning and how do we do that that's the challenge so it has to be a combination of astronomy and construction and you know geometry related skills and i hope that will come forth as we as we go forward in this and other programs thanks thanks anisha and as you said uh, one of our primary uh, aims uh, as we go along to begin with right now is to put forward the functional aspects of it completely in front of the viewers as a resource and then follow that up also with looking at uh, a little bit about maybe it's a uh, conservation history and think in terms of what may be done in future what would for each instrument if it if for its restoration or maintenance what are the issues which may be needed so these are the aspects where you mentioned that uh, it's a very modern kind of modern outlook in that now uh, this was built back in uh, 18, 18th century early 18th century to some extent there is also a critical viewpoint about the absence of um, telescopes or optics which were already there 100 years old that is one aspect which is looked at which in a, in a sense has been uh, used to say that they are poignantly anachronistic on the other hand there is one aspect in which which i think we have uh, over, over many times emphasized they're very modern is that the creator said that these these instruments i am building so that people can use them as a kind of an outreach resource and of course in terms of incorporation of the astronomical content into their structures so this uh, um, uh, the king astronomer savai jc will build five of these observatories of which four are extant gigantic masonry structures built for accurate positional astronomy measurements as envisaged by the creator there may be aspects of what were the accuracies possible, which could be discussed along. And very modern outlook of the creator was that this is for citizen usage. And that is, as you said, Anisha, one of the purposes is that we bring these very much into public space because they were absent from public space for a long period. And, you know, continuing that forward, there's also this thought. It's not that when we are trying to see these instruments, what are the best they can do? That's what, I mean, many of the... Um, work with students we are trying to uh, look at what is the best the instrument could have done back in that time what is the best the instruments could do now and we don't call these meaningless modern day extra accuracies but rather like uh, uh, like the creator in which that even now there are possible innovative usages students could put to to learn astronomy uh, and uh, in fact uh, some of you students with coding skills um, you may be able to contribute to creating of 3D models or uh, you know templates, digital templates for restoration or image processing for um, shadow measurement, which we'll talk about what are the difficulties associated with it. So I think I will first like to urge all of you to, uh, because we are actually today's session, we are aiming at school and college students also in particular. I'd like to ask all of you to think about- I wanted to urge all of you to use your coding skills. You are the one with coding skills. So here we are at the Jantar Mantar Observatory and uh, some of the work which you could easily do with your coding skills once you understand this observatory would help both for education as well as in natural astronomy connections with the observatory. So what I would like to tell you about is 
what are the instruments here what is the basic functioning of these instruments uh, what is their uh, construction uh, what are the basic elements in this so that you may be able to recreate them through 3d models or or any other kind of analysis oriented work which is required essentially we have here in this observatory we have instruments which are meant for positional astronomy and they have very specific uh, designs of construction essentially they, based on incorporating of spherical trigonometry into this construction and then uh, they make essentially two kinds of measurements right time and position and it is position which underlies the measurement of time position position in the sky so based on this let us say shadow falling on any part of the instrument or we put our eye on any part of the instrument and look uh, through or look uh, in line with a particular part of the instrument which would be the part of the gnomon of the instrument and look at the night sky observations night sky objects and thereby we know the positions of these objects position of the sun or the night objects in the sky so this is essentially what the chandrabhanthar observatory is about and now i will tell you a little bit of the details of each of the instruments so that you get an idea about it and i would urge you really to try and make a few 3d models for these instruments okay so that was just to get started uh, with uh, talking to the students who are there there are ways in which that all of you could contribute for in our appreciation of this observatory instruments and so we have to talk about the instruments and uh, today we are going to be mainly talking about the uh, the, the main part main uh, instrument which kind of, you know it stands out in all these observatories so uh, i will just yeah so um here i'm trying to show you show all of these instruments in the four extent observatory so we have here uh, i hope my cursor is visible to all we have here the brihat samrat yantra uh, all right uh, just i think just uh, okay i i think now we don't have the uh, sound echoes we have the brihat samrat yantra here we have the lahu samrat yantra here these two instruments uh, are in the jaipur observatory you can see that there is a very typical uh, portion of the construction for this there is a kind of a triangular wall and there is a kind of an arc here the arc is hidden from the brihat samrat yantra but this construction here we can see that here in the delhi observatory this is the samrat yantra sunken into a kind of a uh, rectangular pit and this is the horizontal arc here now the mishra yantra is not a samrat yantra as such but it has on both sides it has aspects of samrat yantra built into it and then um, sorry uh, yeah we have here uh, it seems to be hidden by this panel not very sure how to get rid of this panel without exiting but we have the uh, the large samrat yantra of the varanasi observatory here which is a very peculiar kind of construction uh, location as it is it's on the terrace i mean first floor of the man mandir which was a kind of an ancestral um, uh, look building in the family of savai jay singh and we have here the smaller samrat yantra in varanasi the, the ganga is just here of the in the man mandir ghat next to the dashar dashar med ghat and we have the samrat yantra here from ujjain uh, ujjain jantarvantar observatory and this is on the banks of the shipra river so these are the extant ones from the historical observatories there are of course also maybe some more modern versions which um, uh, we will be talking about to later on so now coming to an idea about what exactly are these the samrat yantra which we are discussing about what i will do is try to put an uh, overlay of uh, one of these uh, no sorry uh, yeah i'm sorry i 
I have to go back to my presentation because then my cursor can be seen more easily. Yeah, here are some of the, I, I, I hope this can all be seen. Yeah, this can be seen. Uh, the Samrat Yantra instruments, they are of varying sizes. So the Delhi one, the, the Jaipur one is the largest. At the moment, let's just look at this column. And this column is giving us a least count possible with these gigantic instruments. So one second or two seconds here. And uh, then, uh, yeah, this is the Jaipur large one. And 20, uh, the small one is, no, about uh, 20 seconds. And this is 10 seconds here, the large one in Varanasi. The small one, six minutes, yeah. Yeah, and the Ujjain one, also, this is the least count. This has again been taken from this, uh, the, the book by V.N. Sharma, uh, Professor V.N. Sharma. Now, I want to talk about uh, once about the basic way in which these constructions, where we have a triangular wall and an arc of this kind, the basic way in which these constructions are used to measure time. So what is done here? Why are they made like this? Why do we have a kind of a triangular wall? And one will also appreciate as one is walking through all these observatories that there is a kind of a north-south alignment of all instruments. And the Samrat Yantra is placed in the north-south kind of a plane, facing north here. We are facing north in this direction. And there is this triangle. So what is this triangle doing? In this triangle, there is the uh, kind of between the hypotenuse and the base, the angle is supposed to be equal to the latitude of this location. And thereof, thereby, this uh, hypotenuse is pointed towards the north celestial pole. And then this arc becomes perpendicular to this surface. This arc is made perpendicular to this surface and thereby the arc is therefore parallel to the equator of the earth. So this is the special construction which has been done. And this, 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 uh, this construction falls in the category of equinoctial sundials, equal hour sundials. Now what is equal hour here? The equal hour comes about from uh, this fact that along that arc that we saw, in equal hours of time, the shadow moves equal distances. That is what is the equal hour in this. And that is achieved by this uh, specific construction in, in that um, the shadow actually moves parallel to the equator. If it were not moving parallel to the equator, it would not be moving equal intervals of time in uh, uh, equal distances in equal intervals of time. So that is what is achieved. So there are, this is, in a way, this is typical of many equinoctial sundials. However, placing this arc adds an additional um, aspect of convenience to it. Many equinoctial sundials have a triangular wall like this and maybe a flat surface. And markings are mar made on the flat surface. Even they would not be equidistant. But here the markings are equidistant. So now if you encounter a Samrat Yantra like this anywhere, and you want to make time measurements with it, what you do, suppose the markings are there. If the markings are there, if this is the east, this is the east, this is the east, as the sun rises, the shadow would fall on the top, marked as 6 a.m. This is the shadow would fall there. And uh, we actually uh, maybe take a look at some of this from um, uh, a few. We have something, some, some of these views from location. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, we are going now again to Jaipur uh, to look at the bridge. Right. And uh, it's, I think even to date, it is the largest sundial in the world. Yes. Some modern sundials are coming up. Ah. They're trying to build them on this scale. Ah. And uh, so uh, the principle for this, as well as the smaller one, the Lagu Samrati, ah, ah. is exactly similar. It's just that the scale for the two are different. What you see here, uh, in the whole observatory, you'll actually see alignments, all north-south alignments. Every instrument is aligned, north -south supposed to be aligned, aligned exactly, north-south. Mm -hmm. So this is in the meridian plane, north-south, you make an arc yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah, north, hmm. south, right. So, and there is this triangular wall. So the hmm. triangular wall, um, the triangle which you see there, if ah. you look at the... Uh, you draw a baseline for it. Right, right, huh? right. So huh. the angle inside that is supposed to be equal to the latitude of this location. Why? Because if if it is that angle, then what happens is that this hypotenuse, huh. this becomes parallel to the axis of rotation of Earth. 
in the direction of the north celestial pole in fact you come uh, at night uh, and put your eye there and look up you should see dhruv tara small the triangle of wall there called dhruv rasha patika so it just shows the dhruv tara or the north celestial pole the arc that you see there the arc is perpendicular to this the arc then becomes parallel to the equator of the earth the arc then becomes uh parallel to the equator of the earth mm. and it's the shadow of this triangular ball moving on this arc that we see hey. for the time uh -huh. so what happens is that on this particular kind of construction the shadow moves in equal time intervals it moves equal distance because of repetition from what i said but perhaps if some of you have just 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 come to look at this instruments i hope it's all right to have that repetition the arc look at the uh, this this is the same the small uh, we'll take another look at this here we can see that this is where it goes the top of it shows 6 am or 6 pm depending on the morning or and there is the shadow and it touches the base of the instrument when it is noon according to the sundial and it is in the edges in the morning or in the uh, evening and it is somewhere in between and where is it in between can be calibrated very easily because of the way this this is constructed so now uh we can take a look at the two which are there the large one and the small one in jaipur so this is the large one in jaipur and we had a look at the small one too and that brings us to actually the markings which are there on the surface of this this arc is representing Six hours of time in the morning, six hours of time in the afternoon, and we just have to divide it into six equal pieces, uh, six six uh, six pieces for six hours, and subdivisions. And the subdivisions then are going to depend upon how large is the instrument. And some of the uh, uh, the renovations which happened along the way, I think Anisha will tell us about that too. What happened was that uh, uh, initially, when these uh, the quadrants etc. the markings were made. the markings on them were made in indian units of time so the 6 hours of time was divided into gatika and pala 24 minutes being gatika 24 seconds being pala and this was the original division presumably there were later renovations in uh, anisha i think you will tell us a little bit about some of the renovations perhaps which happened which changed this marking scheme which we do need to understand before we move forward to actually look at some observations Oh, sorry, 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 Anish. Uh, one minute, one minute. Uh, pl please, please go ahead again. Yeah, thank you. So I'll just do that. Thank you. But before that, you know, there were two points that you had mentioned during the course of your explanation, and I just want to uh, uh, add a bit to them. So the first thing that uh, when we were discussing the the function or the value of the jantar mantras, one of the things that's uh, that's you know the allegation, let's say, that's made against them is the fact, as you mentioned, that when they were made, the telescope had been. um you know invented or whatever you might like to call it it was in in use and in fact jessing knew about it and therefore there is this entire question about the fact that he didn't incorporate it in his uh in his jantar mantras in his observatory complexes so but i think it's important to communicate the fact that he had a very specific reason for doing so so and he says that in the uh you know in in the prelude to the zigi muhammad chai uh, which was the uh, the the uh the updated astronomical tables that were made on the basis of the jantar mantra so he says that we would like the as you mentioned the observatory to be used by everybody anybody who has an interest in science and uh so that was one so a, a telescope by you know the fact that it's a uh it's it's a single piece has to be protected it can only be used by a certain number of people whereas these huge masonry instruments are such that they can be used by a number of people and they they can be out they don't need to be protected in a building their buildings themselves the second reason i think is that like most indian systems um you know you do have specialization but you keep the entire picture in mind so with these instruments what happens is that as dr ratnishri explained you need to align yourself your eye with uh, you know with 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 the object celestial objects 
keeping the instrument uh, you know in in in, uh, in in alignment and you need to see the shadow of the sun or the uh, on the instrument so you're constantly aware of what you're doing you're looking at the entire sky and i think that's a very important part because most indian knowledge systems do that they're they're quite encyclopedic in their nature and even when you have specific knowledge you're always keeping the larger context in mind so i think that's one very important aspect of the um, let's say the underlying philosophy as well as the structure the research methodology that went into making the jantar mandas uh, and the second thing was sorry uh, yes. uh, sorry, uh, because of the point that you were uh, discussing, if, if I could just step in once at this stage, uh, just sorry. to elaborate on that. Also, one other reason uh, for because of which the telescope may not have had found so much of a place here, uh, although he did mm -hmm. use a telescope, was because the telescope at that time, unless extra instrumentation was there, opened up new parts of the sky. But it, unless you used very intricate uh, instrumentation, it did not allow you to measure position so easily. Yeah, yeah. That will also yes. have been one of the reasons why. Yes. That's yes. Please, uh, yes. Please, yes. Uh, yes. Go ahead. And Thank you. And the other thing is, you know, about the positioning of the, uh, the Varanasi Observatory and the fact that it's on the terrace. So the reason for that is that it was in an urban um, place. It was in a city where otherwise you didn't have your your skyline would be interrupted. Whereas the other Jantar Mantras, because they were made uh, either outside the city. So, for instance, the Delhi Jantar Mantar was outside the walls of Shah Jahanabad, which was the capital at that time, which was the city of Delhi at that time. And this was on Savai Jai Singh's own ancestral property, which was uninhabited and therefore it allowed unimpeded observations. Similarly for the Jaipur Jantar Mantar, because it was an entirely new city that was founded there. So it allowed him to therefore position the uh, observatory in a place where you could take your observations without any interruption, any obstruction. And since Varanasi was already a very densely uh, inhabited city and their property was in in the in 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 Baranasi so the terrace was really the only place which is why therefore the size of the instruments there is that much smaller uh, to get back to uh, the the restoration and conservation exercises that happened to the observatories over time so um i'll i'll start with the delhi uh, jantar mantar because it's one it's the oldest and um, in a sense, it was the one that was interfered with the most because uh, because of the political circumstances at that time, shortly after Jai Singh got the observatory made and after some years, um, he moved back to his new city of Jaipur and um, his principality of Amber. And the area of Delhi was very turbulent. And so the Delhi observatory was actually looted uh, it was specifically looted by the Jats because they were also rebelling against um, against Jai Singh's, uh, you know, sort of overall suzerainty. So they targeted the Delhi Jantar Mantar and it was vandalized. Then subsequently, um, what happened was that the first restoration exercise in Delhi was in 1852. And it was a Samrat Yantra, the one that we are discussing, which was the one that was restored at that time, um, again, with uh, funds and expertise from the Jaipur Rajas. And uh, but what we see today in, in the Delhi Jantar Mantar, for instance, is an outcome of a conservation, the first major conservation as a whole, which happened in 1910. And what happened at that time was that uh, it was not just the expertise of the uh, state astronomers who were you know, proficient in the Indian system of astronomy, but they were supplemented with engineers from the British um, uh, official uh, system as well as uh, you know, uh, their, their advice. So that is the time that uh, a couple of things happened. One is that the markings, the system of markings was changed. So initially it was in this ghatikas and palas. So you know, each arc that Dr. Raj she explained was marked in 15 ghatikas so 15 ghatikas is equal to six hours and by that time then it was it was made in a combination of of, of both so there was both the hour system as well as the ghatika system and um also at that time though uh, the uh, yantra was remarked in um a primarily in plaster but subsequently in a lot of the observatories the jaipur observatory as well um, what happened was that the conservation exercise actually changed the materials of the yantras. 
And I think this is a very important point that we need to appreciate that the original uh, material on the yantras, for instance, at Delhi was stone rubble. And on the top of that, there was this very fine plaster, lime plaster done in several layers over a long time. And lime is a very, very important material. Uh, it's used extensively in India, of course, and in other parts of the world as well. It has this property that it sets very slowly. And if it's done in these very thin layers, what happens is that you can achieve astonishing precision, you know, in, in terms of the edges, in terms of the smoothness. So especially when you're doing markings, when you're doing time markings, which require a lot of, uh, you know, work, if your plaster is going to set very quickly, uh, then if you made a mistake, there's nothing you can do. But with lime plaster, because it sets slowly, you have the time and you have uh, the opportunity to actually make very fine subdivisions, which is what the, especially the large Samrat Yantras had. So they had uh, uh, a smallest uh, count of about two seconds or one second and very, very fine divisions that was possible with lime. The other advantage that lime has is that when it reacts with uh, the air over time, then it sets to form limestone, actually. So it becomes, it hardens with time. It's, it's the only material which becomes more durable with time. And uh, the third quality about it is that it's, it's a breathable render. So it, if there is damp, you know, if there's moisture build up, because remember, these are buildings. These are not just little instruments. These are buildings. They're like rooms, large rooms and spaces inside. Water can get in, moisture can get in. And water is one of the chief causes degradation of buildings. I mean, we know that even as we stay in our modern buildings today. So lime allows the plaster to breathe. It allows a building or a surface to be dry. And therefore, it's very important for the structural, um, let's say, longevity of a building. Now, all that changes because if you when you put stone, it, it looks very permanent. And in fact, I remember when Professor Vian Sharma, who was, he was part of the initial, uh, you know, round of discussions we had with experts when we were, we took up the work of the Delhi Jantar Mantra conservation. So initially, in, in fact, in his book also, he mentions the fact that stone is, is, is what we should be relaying these instruments with. And I remember having this discussion with him and, you know, explaining to him the fact that lime is actually a far better material. And in, by the end, he said, yes, that, that does seem right. It does seem right that we should not be laying these instruments with stone. So I think that's a very, very important aspect that the conservation exercises in the past have changed. And perhaps we need to look at that. And definitely, the, uh, especially the Delhi Jantar Mantra, you know, because a lot of the instruments have not been resurfaced in stone, we have the opportunity of actually getting back the lime plaster if we get the skills. That's also very important. And um, the other thing, of course, is that with lime, when you have a curved surface, because as we saw in, in, the, in the pictures that were shown by both Dr. Ratnishri and Barry, is that they're huge. These are huge dials. They're curved sometimes in three dimensions. And to actually fit a stone to them, uh, you know, is, is extremely difficult. You'll get joints with stone from which there's water ingress. In fact, that happens in the Mishra Yantra in Delhi. Uh, so when we were doing the conservation, we discovered a lot of damp inside the building because of the fact that it's been surfaced in marble. So these are some of the issues, the materials, um, the, the markings themselves, is, you know, and the subdivisions, which had, and of course, the greatest thing, the greatest uh, so change, especially in Delhi, is the fact that because of water uh, seepage, the pit in which the Samrat Yantra is positioned was uh, it was raised and therefore only part of the dials are visible today. Uh, but uh, so that that's that's a huge uh, sort of, let's say, handicap because we don't have the entire, uh, you know, the arc of, of both the, uh, the, the semi uh, the quadrants on both sides. And we cannot actually get it back now because it's it's done in cement. It might have structural repercussions. But this is something to be very aware of that interventions that we do have to be done with a lot of thought and as far as possible with the original materials and with the original skills while trying to of course make sense of them in our in our world today yeah. thanks uh, i in particular wanted to alert uh, all all of the all particular students who may be listening in from these observatories that uh, the markings you may wonder that when you see hours, minutes, seconds, that how come they came about here because they're different from the Indian units. So they were later on interventions, but on the sides of these instruments. So if you will uh, take a look at, uh, let, let me just put a render of that from Barry's site. So we can see the uh, the arc 
and uh, the triangle there right so the the uh, on the surface the horizontal surface the markings would be in hours minutes seconds on the sides the markings are in the gatika and pala so if you want to do observations you uh, you can just uh, take a look at that and accordingly do the divisions and anisha as you were uh, mentioning um the pit in delhi so perhaps uh, we we'll take a look at uh, the delhi um uh, surfaces and so on and uh, what uh, is been uh, uh, possible to do this is the delhi observatory and um, this is the pit and as anisha was mentioning at some point because of water logging the pit was filled in you see this arc this entire arc was going and touching this at the bottom and so again the six hours were in that entire arc some part of it was missing so um, at one time um, we did a kind of a calibration of this on uh, very just by chalk we marked every one minute inside that and this was the public observations and actually this is 20 seconds and 20 seconds and we can see that the maximum of these observations was coming at about 2 seconds now this somebody who knows about the uh, the sundials may actually challenge a little bit because uh, the see what we are trying to do here is the movement of the sun is giving us time and this is incorporated in um, masonry and lime plaster and so on all of this gives rise to certain um irregularities so certain errors which will be there in a sundial however uh, these gigantic structures the creator intended that they should give very high accuracies some of the irregularities give rise to certain errors in it but in this case of course what we did was we did a kind of an observational calibration which washed out washed out the errors and therefore it was possible to see differences in uh, time at as uh, one second kind of it was physically possible to measure differences of one second in time which is what was demonstrated with for the for the delhi observatory this was work which was done in 2006 and in this connection when we uh, uh, because the intention of the creator was that we should have high accuracy and therefore he made larger and larger and as of now we are only talking of time there are other functionalities which we will talk about of these same instruments but in time measurement if we are looking at accuracy with large scale what happens is that there is a bit of a problem in this and in fact they saying uh, there, there was also a criticism in this connection which came about by blantry saying that if you have such gigantic uh, scales which are constructed in sundials the very fact that the penumbra the kind of shadow movement is so fast there is the umbra and the penumbra of the shadow which gives rise to additional confusion given all of that uh there was this um, uh, uh criticism of this but for these large ones there is a very innovative method and this is a traditional method which has been used to make sure that when you have this large uh, i i showed that entire scale uh, that that large structure when you were talking about anisha about these structures being so very huge and here we have this view of the quadrant of the samrat yantra in one of the views which has been created by barry and we can see that this this very huge structure in this the shadow runs very fast so fast that if you are standing nearby if you are standing nearby it gets very difficult even to say that the shadow is here okay let me mark the time and so on so there is a very interesting trick and this is a very traditional trick and the guides there will also tell you about it in the jaipur observatory and that is to use even the gigantic scale of the quadrant the whole instrument and the quadrant in particular and uh, given the height of the new moon and the distance between where the wall is and where its shadow falls mm, the shadow when you observe it from close by uh, is rather difficult to delineate demarcate and take pinpointed observation unless you use certain tricks in fact it's this difficulty is perhaps give rise to some criticism uh as to why its creator made such a large instrument with this least count when taking observations at such fine uh dimension seems so difficult well use a trick the trick is hold up just a piece of hair a strand of hair look at its shadow and just at the edge 
of the broad shadow where uh, the shadow falls on the instrument where this thin strand of hair disappears the shadow of this disappears is your point mark that when then of course it takes some amount of experience observing this to get confidence that yes this is the point to be marked Experiments and tricks have been there incorporated in the way the observatory is to be used, and we still have to complete our discussion about the time measurement because, as of now, uh, when we had a look at um, the uh, when we had a look at the uh, numon uh, the the picture, we talked of how the time can be divided into so many hours, uh, six hours this side, six hours that side. However, the time that this gives us, so when the shadow is at the top, being six a.m. or twelve noon or six p.m. or thereof, this is the time that the sundial is showing. But this sundial time has to be converted to our clock time. So to con to make this conversion to a clock time, uh, something called the equation of time and also a correction for the longitude because sundial tells us the time of that location. Whereas for the whole country, for instance, there is one longitude which is giving us the standard time. and so on so there is one constant correction and there is a variable correction the variable correction is called the equation of time which kind of is a difference in the way a mean sun and the actual sun is progressing in the sky so because of this sometimes the sun is faster in the sky and sometimes it is slower compared to the mean sun and so this is this is the kind of a curve which is the equation of time and this can be used this arises from two aspects the spin of axis of rotation of earth this axis is tilted with respect to the plane in which this is going around the sun and also earth's orbit is little bit elliptical these two combined give rise to this equation of time correction which has to be done and a constant correction for the longitude now at the jaipur observatory for instance near the lagu samrat yantra a correction factor is kept for the day the correction factor keeps changing day by day and they put that correction factor there and so using this once you read off the time from this uh samrat yantra or any of the time instruments you put in this correction and you get the clock time and it is that clock time then which we are looking at in terms of what are the kind of possibilities of accuracies i would actually like to just run us through some of these for the different the 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 hair trick which has been uh, mentioned by many people and vn sharma's book also mentions it uh is that uh, uh using that i have done several observations at the uh, jaipur one uh however i don't have a huge database of observations from there but this is the daily observations of time and uh, there are some some observations from lagu samrat yantra which is a very popular one uh with with uh, with everyone who comes there because it's much easier to observe from there and these are some of the errors which are there we can see that much larger errors come these are the errors from the varanasi samrat yantra the larger samrat yantra we can see that there seem to be some kind of systematics and i would like to discuss why these systematics come about and this point has also been mentioned as an intriguing aspect in uh, professor vijayan sharma's book and i think looking at some of this data actually resolves that that aspect so if there is time i would like to come to that at one time here are some observations from the ujjain observatory also so these are some some possibilities of observations which students could collect from these observatories and i was mentioning right in the beginning that uh, there is uh, there is a way in which many of you students with your with your skills could get involved in and uh, as i was saying that this is where maybe you come in and do some observations and learn astronomy that is one primary purpose with which we want to use this as a teaching laboratory of astronomy and you could use modern skills too as long as you don't interfere with the observatory because that is the purpose of the creator right we learn astronomy with this so when we look at the shadow the shadow definition becomes an issue in this i would like to just just very briefly uh, talk about that um what are the shadow issues and why certain errors come and how students can actually use maybe your skills to give us a very accurate views of these shadows so let me just uh, i i am actually going i'm looking for an image from professor sharma's book which i'm using as a starting point to discuss this uh, shadow issues oh okay i need to actually share for that i need to share some images which i have so i'll just just do that yeah so let me uh, take up these images 
And yeah, this is the this is the image which is there from Professor V. N. Sharma's book. What is happening here? I uh, yeah. What is happening here is that we have this wall and we have the quadrant. The sun shadow is falling on the quadrant. So as we can see, sun is an extended body. So we have actually the edge of the shadow and we have the penumbra of the shadow. And it is the midway point actually which is giving us the correct location for measuring time. This midway point as it moves 6 a.m. and 12 noon and in between times it is telling us. But it is very difficult to judge this midway point. Typically, we judge the edge between the umbra and the penumbra. And therefore, what happens is there is a possibility that here we are running ahead of the uh, sundial clock. And if we then uh, go to the other view in the afternoon, we are running a little slow of the clock because we are actually judging somewhere here, edge of the umbra penumbra. This is the afternoon shadow, which is running up. So we actually judge it to be here. So we get a little slower time in the afternoon and we get a uh, faster time. And uh, uh, Anisha, you may uh, may recollect this point also discussed in Professor Sharma's book. And by, after looking at a lot of observations which I have done with many of the Samrati and Thira, I realized that there is a systematic, yes. And the systematic may be coming about because of this fact that the penumbra width, it's very difficult to judge. And so we judge it near the umbra penumbra edge instead of midway. And this particular problem is overcome in one other time instrument, which perhaps we will not be discussing this session, but the next one, which are the Nadi Valaya. The Nadi Valaya actually do not have this penumbra umbra problem. We'll discuss them in the next uh, session. But perhaps we should move on to talk about other aspects of the Samrat Yantra, some other measurements which the Samrat Yantra could do. Uh, 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 one minute. Uh, I was just actually, yeah, yeah, please, Anisha. Uh, Dr. Anisha. Yeah, just related to, you know, a couple of things that you said, I, I just wanted to uh, come back to them. So one is the fact about how there are two aspects that go into making the reading of time or any other, uh, let's say, reading from these yantras successful. One is, of course, the instruments themselves and how well they are constructed and how well they're detailed. That is first. The second part is the, the human judgment and how you can actually the you know different people and as you mentioned and even uh, Pandit Sharma showed me this trick with his he actually pulled out a hair of his and he superimposed it and I saw for myself the the possibilities in in uh, sort of overcoming the penumbra umbra problem. So this reminds me, for instance, of you know also the way our craftspeople work. So very often you will see that they have very simple tools. I mean, very often the term used for them, though I don't agree with that term, is very primitive tools. In the sense, they're very basic tools, but they what they generate from them is is very very. Uh, it's, it's highly evolved in terms of the detail as well as sophistication of design and the amount of, let's say, uh, the, the skill is evident in the product. And I think, therefore, when we're talking about bringing the yantras back into usage, uh, one is, of course, the physical conservation of the, the instruments themselves. And the other is training, you know, in, in anybody who wishes to actually use the instruments. So because with, with trial and error, with training, you can actually use these very successfully. So I think the human resource is a very important part, and that was considered initially as well when these instruments were made, and that is something we have to consider now as well. So anybody who wishes to use these, therefore, you know, with time and with proper training, you can actually use this very successfully. Um, you know, depending on the sort of accuracy that is possible with 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 these instruments. That's one. Point. The second was, if you recollect, you mentioned uh, the fact that we got students, uh, you know, the Delhi Planetarium got students to uh, participate in an exercise where there were markings done on the Samrati Yantra. And I think this was part of the outreach activities in which, you know, the Jantar Mantra project that we were doing was, was also involved. So there was this very interesting suggestion that you had put forward then, which I'd like to, uh, you know, again, talk about now, where we spoke about the fact that it may not be possible to get back the entire uh, the entire arc because you know you don't know how what the structural sort of situation is with the pit and getting back to the original that may not be possible. But one suggestion that you had made then, which I think is 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 a very valid suggestion, is that where you have the flat points of the arcs, you know, so why not 
treat that as um, an unequal sundial. And where you have the arcs, you have the equal sundial. So uh, basically, you make do with what you have the situation now. But the purpose is the same as that of the original creators of the observatory, which is that you bring back the young time to use. You're able to actually tell time with it. You're able to understand the movement of the sun and how it relates to the shadow movements, etc. So I think that is something perhaps that we could discuss later as well. But it's a very important fact that when you cannot uh, restore an original attribute what can you do to actually get the original spirit of the uh, you know the purpose yes. of the when we so come to the what... there is yeah there is an aspect where there is no way we can go back to the original because of the precision of earth's axis of rotation so as you are saying yes there are various places where we we accept what is there now and then uh, go on with making sure that these are brought into usage and as i said even if there are possibilities of uh, modern usage like uh, students doing image processing to judge the sh shadow uh, there, there is no harm in that as long as we are not interfering with the instrument this is wonderful ways in which the observatory can be used for uh, for for getting students involved for getting people involved in doing astronomy with these instruments and also of course celebrating the traditional methods we'll will uh, also come across that once more when we come to the jayprakash but did you want to add anything i wanted to also then uh, after taking your inputs i want to move to how declination etc are measured with these instruments because we are talking of the samrati yantra today so i i hand over to you bari meanwhile i'll just get the visuals for that ready Okay, so there are just a couple of things um, about the exactness of the instruments. Um, besides just the kind of the aspiration for more precision and to be able to have um, better measurements, I think there's just something philosophically important about and and this also has to do with the communal uh, gesture of Jai Singh. Um, it's so important that we, anyone, any ordinary person can sort of experience this precision of measurement, precision of reflection of the earth's rotation of the Earth's movement in the larger scale of cosmic motion. Uh, these are things which are theoretical. They're taught in a theoretical way with diagrams and uh, descriptions to try to have mental pictures. As we lose the dark skies, we also lose that sort of initial impression that probably drove early observers, the fact that on a night with a dark sky, if you are watching the sky day by day, week by week, year by year, you realize that we're in a moving universe, that, that there are so many elements that are changing places, moving around. And it just, it raises an unanswerable question. Uh, you know, where are we? Who are we? What is our relationship to all of this? And that's just not reflected in, in a palpable way very much in our everyday world. These observatories, and I, I think the importance of the precision of the scales is as a reminder uh, of this relationship we have, and we do have the relationship even if we aren't thinking about it. Um, we are on this moving world spinning, um, we have a great deal of information through science, through advanced instrumentation of um, realms that we don't perceive directly, we think through our senses, uh, gamma radiation, all sorts of other um, electromagnetic energies that we don't see. Um, but there is just something powerfully important uh, about feeling our place, feeling that we're in the midst of an awesome scale, awesome universe. So that that was one thing. Um, the uh, the only other thing was a quick reply to um, Dishant Kumar from the very beginning of the 
of the talk about the circular and um, square lenses that I'm wearing. Um, maybe it's my love for the for geometry and visual things, but um, he's a good observer. That was a good observation. And uh, the glasses are um, just one of my ways of, of sharing a love of, of geometry and shape. So back to you. Thank, thank you for, uh, I mean, uh, bringing us back to also the philosophical outlook in terms of in this observatory instruments. The accuracy of the uh, markings, looking at them also, I mean, from this point of view that there was uh, the, the drive of the creator was that what can I do to get better and better accuracies? Now in that, maybe one of the directions he went to was one way. There are other ways which modern uh, directions have gone in. And the thing is that we have this heritage, and this is this is a place which which come in a, in a way it, uh, kind of brings us into the cosmos. And by uh, striving to get better equities with these existing conditions of the instruments, we are in a way following what the Creator wanted us to do. So that is the spirit in which. I have kind of been always trying to work with students to try and get better and better accuracies with these instruments. And that takes me to uh, talking about um, uh, one aspect, one more aspect of the Samrat Yantra. All of the Samrat Yantra have one other measurement which is possible. And this measurement is of a quantity called the declination. And there's one other quantity also in this framework which can be done, but mainly let us look at this declination which can be measured. What is this? So we have here the center of the earth and we have a celestial object, say the sun. And here we have the horizon where the direction where the earth meets the sky. And uh, uh, no, wait, I'm sorry. I made a mistake there. This, this direction is the equator. This is the equator of the earth. This is the equator of the earth and this is the sun. And the angle between the equator and this line from the sun, this is the declination. The declination of the sun changes throughout the year. So from minus 23 and a half to about 23 and a half, it varies. And what we call the Uttaraya and Dakshinaya motion of the sun is what is this declination. And now the observatory instruments have a very interesting way. Uh, I hope the presentation was being shared at that time. No. When I was showing, it wasn't all right. So uh, I think I need to just just I'll just show the that image quickly once, and maybe if I do my entire screen for now, let me just do the entire screen for now. And this was the view of the declination, where here we have the center of the Earth and the celestial object, and uh, this is the equator. And this is the uh, oh, this is the declination and the declination changing of the sun Uttarayan and Dakshinayan is here. And I want to now show how we we use the Samrat Yantra. Here we have an image from the Lagu Samrat Yantra. I hope this is visible to uh, in the uh, okay. This is not a very high resolution image, but let's make do with this for now. So here we have the triangular wall, right? And the steps which are supposed to go go off to nowhere going towards the pole star for now. So on these steps, it is possible to do one other measurement. And this is a measurement which is really very, very, uh, and very interesting for students to give uh, an attempt to make these measurements accurately. This is a little intriguing also how this has been incorporated in it. See, this one, this is, this is going towards the pole. This is along the axis of rotation of Earth. This is parallel to the equator. So it is the angle from the equator where the sun is. So the sun is going to be either north of the equator or south of the equator throughout its Uttarayan Dakshinayan motion. So what happens is that on these walls, that angle, so a line coming from here perpendicularly up to the wall and a line going to the sun, the angle between them essentially is part of this triangle construction. So these angles are incorporated here. So you can see this black line here. So that black line is where these, are, these uh, measurement scales are repeated in a way. So what happens is that if you look at this part, this one uh, is to the lower part of this quadrant. This is connected. And the upper part of the quadrant is connected to this one. So what happens is that we, let's say, place a pen or something along this and look at the shadow of the pen falling, let's say, on the upper one. 
So if we, if we look at that, what, what happens is that where we place the pen on this scale, this is going to tell us actually the declination of the sun. So what happens is you think of drawing a triangle on the wall of this, and that triangle has a perpendicular line from the equator and a line going to the sun. And basically the angle between those two, that's all that is needed. And it is those angles which are incorporated here. So to the south of the instrument, when sun is northwards, we will see the shadow on this side. And when sun is southwards, we will see the shadow on this side. So therefore, there's a doubling for part of the scale here where the declination is actually measured. And um, OK, so that is uh, about one method of measuring what is called the declination, which is uh, the angle between the equator and the sun or any object and the walls of this uh, Samrat Yantra incorporated. There is also one other very interesting instrument called Sastamsha inside this, which also measures this. And um, I was just, I, I, it seems like I'm missing one particular ray diagram, which is there in Professor Sharma's book, which shows us the side view. But somehow I'm missing it from here. So um, let me see if there are anybody who is having any uh, question. Because I think I was not very clear as to how exactly the triangle. Let me maybe use this book and see, see if I can. This is Professor Sharma's book. So if we draw a kind of uh, a triangle here, and we have the arc at the center, who from the arc, we draw a line up perpendicularly, perpendicular to the arc. And then there is a line which is going to the sun. So the angle between these two, and this is just transformed trigonometrically onto the surface, surface markings. And these surface markings, we put a pen or something on the surface. Look at the shadow on the quadrant. And by moving the pen along the quadrant here, along the surface, triangular surface, the Newman surface here, we are actually able to measure this angle between the sun and when you look at the shadow between the sun and the equator, or in the night time, we actually place something and then look across that, and we are able to measure this declination. And I will also now try to show you how this, uh, yeah, somebody says that he wants to see it pictorially. So I will try and uh, bring that in in a while. First, let me show you also something called the Sastamsha, which is um, another way in which this can be used. Uh, and, oh, I don't seem to be having my, uh, all right. So, OK, so here we have. This is the second way in which the Samrat Yantra could be used to measure the declination. So uh, the declination then is measured inside an instrument here. This is the western wall, western quadrant, and the wall supporting the quadrant. There is a room inside this. And there are holes here. And through these holes, when the sun actually just transits the meridian, when it goes to the highest point that it can go on that day, only at that time, through these holes, the sunlight pours in into the room and it actually comes and falls on a scale. There's a sextant scale inside that and the sun shadow falls on this. And on this sextant, what we can measure actually is what is called the angular height of the sun at the time that it is transiting the meridian from the horizon what is the angular height of the sun that is what can be measured on that sextant and we can convert that to getting an idea about the declination of the sun the declination of the sun the latitude of the location and the altitude of the sun at the time of the transit get related in one way and one or the other can be measured using this instrument this is in fact the most sensitive instrument in this in the observatory and uh, so uh, this can also allow you to take a look at the sun uh, get a nice projected image of the sun during the transit of venus in 2004 the observatory staff saw, saw transit of venus in this uh, in this projected image of the sun and during the transit of venus of 2012 actually it wasn't the noon did finish before the noon time so now it's, I mean, it's not going to be in our lifetime the transit of Venus can be seen inside the Sastamsha instrument. And, uh, but 
this is a wonderful way in which the, you can observe the sun, project an image of the sun, look at sunspots, and measure. The primary aim of it is to measure the meridian altitude, and therefore, from there, to get an idea of the declination of the sun. So now, uh, for that image, perhaps I will try and share it with the students later on, uh, since I don't have it right away with me. Uh, I, I think I will like. I will also. Uh, I, I like Colin uh, Barry because uh, we, uh, uh, from your, uh, I'll, I'll also put in your presentation here, Barry, because we can see some of the movements of the sun, uh, both in terms of the time. We can see here the uh, the quadrant where you can see the shadow movement. This is going to tell us the time uh, for one whole, uh, let's say, morning or one whole afternoon. Uh, so shall I hand over to you, Barry, to show some sure. of the time lapse? Yes, uh, that's fine. So this is the um, eastern quadrant. So it's showing afternoon time. Uh, and it's just a short period of time. But if we play the time lapse, you see the shadow movement. It's probably about an hour, hour and a half. And so it's moving from noon would be right here, midday at the base moving up towards 6 p.m. up here. And then we have another view. This is of the western quadrant, so it's showing time that starts at the top 6 a.m. and comes down towards noon. This is late morning. <clears throat> and here you see the shadow, in fact, is soft. But you can also see the fineness of the markings, but also how soft the shadow is. Now, I will say that this was not a really clear sky. There was a bit of haze and overcast, so the shadow has less contrast than it would on a good clear day. But still, you have the problem of the umbra and penumbra. And when I was there um, with Dr. Bhattacharya from the um, observatory, uh, the, the museum in, in Jaipur, no, actually, I think the planetarium in Jaipur um, met with me and explained the method that you spoke about using a hair. Uh, but he just picked up a thin twig and you can't really see clearly the shadow movement here, but if he moves the twig back and forth in the shadow, the point at which it disappears, as you were describing, that we consider the center and we use that point. So it, it gives a great deal of precision, um, a little bit the way a vernier dial does on a, a large dial. It gives you a, a very sub sort of micro measurement within a, a larger gross measurement. And I think it's just beautiful. I was also going to try to bring up, um, I have an interior view of the Shastamsa Yantra uh, for the declination. Um, but it may take me a moment to find it. Uh, if you want to go on, continue on, I'll look for that in the book and let you know when I have it. Um. <clears throat> so while Barry is uh... okay, here we go. <clears throat> so. 
So this was the instrument inside the structure that houses uh, the quadrant of the Samrat Yantra um, is this room. It's a dark room. It based on actually the um, early understanding and photography of the pinhole camera. And these circular spots is not just the light from the sun, it's actually an image of the sun, you know, formed by these yes. tiny holes yes, yes, yes. in the roof. And so this projection of this, the actual circular image of the sun appears as the sun reaches meridian. Um, and then it's up here on the dial. Uh, this is a quadrant, this arc, just like uh, it's a perfect um, circumferential arc. Um, and as Ratna showed in the detail, this is that circular image of the sun. And the scale um, is graded in units that describe the declination angle. So the the image moves across the scale very quickly during noon, but over the months, its position where it crosses the quadrant shifts to show the gradual change in declination of the sun from um, one point in the year to another. Yes, yes. I was also looking for an image I had, which actually shows when it is not quiet at the meridian, uh, and then uh, when it moves towards the meridian, okay, I am not finding that image now to share. All right, so let me just leave that. I think this, the, what you shared gave a good idea to people about uh, the fact that when you are inside that room, uh, just only when the sun is transiting the meridian, you would get this image falling there on the surface of the sextant, allowing us to do a number of quantitative measures. And there are actually four of these sextants, two on one side, two on the other side. So uh, this is this is the Sastamsha. The Sastamsha is also there in Delhi, by the way, but it has been filled up. The access is not uh, there now. So we do not know what is the status of the Sastamsha instrument at Delhi. And uh, so these are the, have I left out any of the functionalities? Well, there is one other functionality of the Samarat Yantra. And those of you who are amateur astronomers would appreciate that the Samarat Yantra construction is, uh, oh, uh, Barry, was I interrupting you? Please go no, ahead. No, go ahead. All done. So uh, I was just mentioning the fact that you have this triangular wall, which is pointing towards the North Celestial Pole, is uh, giving you an idea that this is like the equatorial, uh, in a way, constructions that you have for your uh, amateur telescopes. And uh, that, that's why, you know, any diurnal movement is only in one plane along the arc. There's only that one plane in which the movement is uh, uh, taking place. And therefore, there are two uh, kind of, uh, th th there are several ways in which the coordinates in the sky are actually understood. So um, in such a construction, the coordinate framework, which is primarily in usage, is that of the equatorial coordinates, which we already talked about to some extent. The, there are two coordinates here. We are thinking of all objects in the sky as if they are on the surface of a inverted football on our head. So the, the distances along the line of sight are ignored in this. And uh, so in this kind of positional astronomy framework, um, we have two coordinates in any of this. So the two coordinates in this equatorial framework are referring to the angle from the equator. We have Earth's equator out there. We put it out in the sky. And there is also the annual apparent path of the sun. This is called the ecliptic. So this is... Um, this is, there are two such arcs in the sky and there are two points where the arcs meet. These are the equinoxes and the March equinox is in fact one of the uh, starting points for this coordinate framework which we have. The declination is simple enough to understand angle from the equator. But also perpendicular to the declination, there are coordinates which are measured to actually pinpoint an object in the sky. So when measuring along the equator, so although the Samrat Yantra does not have very specific constructions, unlike 
for the declination we have specific markings but coordinates along the equator just like the time is moving along the equator can be measured by doing a kind of a reference measurement with respect to let's say another star in the night time if you if you if you see when one star is crossing the meridian and when another star is crossing the meridian or the position of the star with respect to a pointer that we keep coordinate along this path can also be measured so this is something which when you are measure when somebody is doing measurements can be done for the construction point of view this is not really uh, there, there is no additional construction required to make this measurement along the equator so this is uh, anisha have i left out anisha bari have i left out any functionalities of the samrat yantra in this there are of course those uh, more a uh, little more modern constructions of additional sundials in the top of the samrat yantra and so on which i have not touched upon but essentially the two, the the time time path and the equatorial coordinates these are the two main paths which are incorporated in the samrat yantra and uh, though of course so the sastamsha is not really there in any of the smaller instruments only in the delhi and the jaipur one and the smaller ones don't have this but even the smaller ones can do the the nomon declination measurement every samrat yantra can do this nomon declination measurement so this kind of sums up what a samrat yantra can do and we are also going to have some people come in in our next session who have constructed this samrat yantra in smaller scales and what are the uh, kind of interesting results uh, basically just that that these, these are ways in which we can appreciate these uh, observatories and uh, so we have a modern one in delhi too so i think we may perhaps because we have really short overshot the time for this session so we will go to other time instruments and other aspects in the next session so uh, i i'll just yeah. just just one yes yeah, please go ahead is that um i think what is also when we appreciate the samrat yantra what we also need to appreciate is the economy of the entire construction so it's huge but every part of it has a function so the nomon doesn't just cast a shadow on the arcs and allow us to read the time but it also has the declination markings of course unfortunately the delhi samrat yantra because uh, you know the the edges of the nomon were uh conserved in cement plaster which uh, you know in cement doesn't act cohesively it acts like in blocks so uh, the the accuracy of the 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 proportions has been altered and we don't have the markings anymore but nonetheless in its original form i think what we need to appreciate is that each surface each component of the construction had a function so whether you know and the structural functions as well as the astronomy function sort of overlap so i think one of the reasons the large samrat yantra has a shastamsa is that it also sort of helps to stabilize the entire construction when you have the walls at the end and then you also give uh, you know make a use of it so i think that's also a wonderful aspect of these observatories that um, the fact that each part has a function so nothing is superfluous and also um, if if we look at the samrat we see there's a rhythm of arches and that's also to scoop out the weight of the huge construction so again what we think of as you know the the visual or the aesthetic aspects of the construction are again related either to the structural stability or to the functional component of the the, the instrument so i think that's 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 an important part because they are buildings uh, which has been kept in mind and that's that's a wonderful aspect of the uh, observatory and uh, even where the markings are missing of the instruments the base of the instrument is sufficiently intact almost yes, no the instrument we have found not possible to use for observation other than the mm. uh, the yantra raj no instrument mm. has been not possible to use because the base is still intact even if the markings yes. are not intact yes. so that's why yes. they are really nice for uh, students to use to learn astronomy bari you were saying something yes one other thing that uh, doesn't have to do with directly with the measuring or scales but uh it has to do with ergo ergonomics and design um these huge instruments had to be functional for the observers for the astronomers and one of the most beautiful things for me is the um stairways and steps that were created anyone who has climbed to the top of the quadrant appreciates uh the the fascinating design of step height changes 
um, multiple steps in order to reach the very highest parts. Uh, and they are aesthetically fascinating too when you when you see these things from overhead, the complex nature of the stairways. And there are other instruments when we talk about the Jai Prakash, um, how the instruments provided access, really important. Yeah. Thanks for that. And there are a few a few questions and comments. Suhas Gurjar wants to know, is it not possible to calibrate not with shadow, but by geometry of the instrument? Uh, Suhas, uh, I'm not very clear what, about the question. But the thing is that, see, uh, like if you read through Professor Sharma's book, all the aspects of the instrument by looking at the geometry and the construction, he has enumerated. What are the possible errors which could come in by looking at the construction itself? When we want to take celestial observations, then of course we are looking at. I mean, we are looking at those observations to learn, and observations can also help us do a kind of a statistical calibration. But you are right that we're looking at the like, like enumerated in Professor Sharma's book. The basic part of the instruments is enumerated by looking at the geometry and how the geometry is incorporated in physically there. The uh, was there anything you wanted to add, uh, Anisha? You you were saying something. Yes. Yes, basically, I mean, the, the, just to add to what you're saying, the principles can be understood through the geometry. But if you want accurate measurements, then, of course, you need the markings. Huh, huh, yes. Uh, Ritwik says that he did not understand the last part with the shadow. I have a feeling it must be to do with the declination measurement. And mm -hmm. let me just maybe show that uh, once again how the declination uh, construction Yes. Um, maybe perhaps... I'll have to take your leave at this point. So it's been, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think I'll have to leave. And yeah, yeah. I it's been a very, 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 very long uh, session. And yeah, uh, yeah. So thanks so much for being there. And we are going to continue in the second session also to talk about some aspects of conservation and some of the historical yes. aspects. But and also the specifics of some of the other time measurement instruments and so on. Yes. So we'll see you in Thank the next you. session then. Yes. Thank you for Thank you so much, Thank you, Barry. Thank you. So there is, uh, I'm just, just mean, uh, meanwhile, just checking if there are any other questions. And uh, I, I think perhaps some of the uh, usage did not, uh, mm, I did not put out as much of visualizations as I wanted to. So maybe uh, some more questions would come if it was a little more of the visual were present. Perhaps we could do that next time. And uh, uh, for uh, Ritwik, for your question, I am presuming that it is this you wanted to know. And this is the triangle here. And this is the perpendicular to the equator. Uh oh, perpendicular to the equator. And where we place a pen or a stick, somewhere here. And we're so not, it is this angle. We're not seeing oh, it. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did not add it to the stream. So once again, uh, so this is the uh, view from the side of the Samrat Yantra. And this is where the quadrant is. And this, this figure is from Professor Sharma's book. And this is perpendicular to the equator. And this is the angle, which is wherever we are placing our pen, let's say, so that the shadow falls here, which is going to tell us the declination. And once the pandemic is over, we actually may be going to these observatories and doing. So I do invite all the students to come there. And those of you who are not uh, in these cities to take part in observations, you, we can still uh, have you on board. We will give you some of the shadow images and see whether maybe you can do image processing to pinpoint the exact point halfway through the from the penumbra and so on. And once again, these may be modern aspects of observatory usage, which Perhaps to some may look like, no, we are clashing with tradition. But I, I, I feel that, look, the creator said, let's go for accuracy in whatever way possible. So if we are now doing some other modern things, that's also if you are trying to see what better accuracies are possible. What do you say, Barry? That's one of the things which I was thinking is a way in which we can celebrate the observatories. Yes, yes. I agree. <laughs> Okay, so uh, actually there are so many comments that I'm, I maybe I missed some questions in between. Most of the comments have been comments, so uh, I may have missed. So I think maybe we just close it now. And if I miss any of the questions, since we are going to have subsequent sessions, we could take them up. 
So shall we conclude uh, for the day today? And we will meet again in one of the subsequent sessions. Sounds good. Uh, to discuss more of the more of the observatory instruments. Today we just did the Samrat Yantra. So look out for many more instruments to come.